All right. Okay, we're on muted. Mr. Scripture, we're doing a sound check. I can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you.
hearing their discussion, how do you vote, Ms. Tony? How do you vote, Ms. Tony? How do you vote, Mr. Lee? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Robin? And I vote yes, the personnel agenda is approved. The next item is the approval of minutes from November 7th, 2022 and December 5th, 2022. I think I'm going to change the period of time. This is already a major motion. So, starting with NSF, presented for November. Please speak to me if you have a question. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, how do you vote, Mr. Lee? Yes. How do you vote, Mr. Lee? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Cheney? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Robin? Yes. And I vote yes. The minutes are approved. Our next item is the consent agenda. Tonight, under consent agenda, we have technology surplus items. <laughs> the T, um, Carol Norwich School out-of-state field trip for our fifth graders to Bush Gardens. And then a Columbia High School out-of-state field trip for the school to go to um, I think that back. Carol Elementary <laughs> School is Colonial Williamsburg for the grade, and the Columbia High School I'm saying so as they go to um, Bush Gardens. <laughs> this Robin's made a motion to approve the consent agenda. Um, is there any discussion? I do Excuse me. So, how do you vote, Mr. Lee? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Jamie? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Jamie? And how do you vote, Ms. Robin? And I vote yes. The consent agenda is approved. Is there a reason to reorder the agenda? Okay. And would you like to add that under? Number 12, school days published in school days. Yes, okay. But in the centers, we have a school that they, I mean, for one, actually, for two years, two years, two years. System and for the CHU. Okay. And that would be under the uh, agenda item 12 also. School things to put the school there is under B, CTE learning lab update. So add in there. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is our public forum. This is just a reminder that the purpose of our public forum is to afford the public the opportunity to address the board in three minutes on matters related to policy or general concern. The board will listen and may ask questions to try to understand the matter being presented. As a general rule, the board delays discussion and or decision until a later time. Since this is the only time on the agenda that the audience may participate in the board's meeting, any person wishes to address the board, she or he should make it known at this time. Please remember that no person addressing the board may refer to a student or employee by name, as they are protected from all from such and may only be discussed in closed session as governed by board policy and commonly recognized practice. I don't see anyone's name on the um, public comment, but if there anybody who would like to add their name to public comment, now is the time to do that. Okay, thank you. We'll move on now to commendations, awards, and presentations. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I want to ask Dr. Roseboro to join me at the podium as well as the board members across the front so that we can get this done. Exposition. I hope. All 
So as you can see, the staff is sick. <laughs> we're, so, we're so very happy um, that we have these accommodations to recognize on this evening. It means a lot to our district when we can see the progress that is made in every department. And that's what we're here to honor tonight. So our first one, I have to tell you that I walked into a meeting late today and I saw for transportation that uh, Mr. Murphy's scores had gone from 57 to 72 percent. I was, I was 17. It was 57 to 17. I'm going to let him expand on that. He should like to. And I said to him, I said, I thought he was doing good over there. Yeah. <laughs> I hope and trust in him to run that transition. <laughs> he would tell you that I did. We had a conversation. And lo and behold, the lower you are, the better. So on this evening, we want to do the certificate of recognition. Let me get it out. To Ronnie Murphy for outstanding scores on annual bus inspections from 57% to 72%. Congratulations. Yes, yes, yes. 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 I was going to stand on it in my presentation, but kind of sort of what it is is we, we have a annual inspection every year, once a year, where the inspector comes from the state and uh, he inspects a minimum of 10% of your buses. And with us being small as we are, it's a minimum of two buses. So uh, he inspects two buses, two yellow buses, um, score of 17 and a half. Seven and a half last year, 17 and a half this year. He inspected one, one white bus and our gray the white bus was 16. And oh, wow. The lower the score, the better the score. And I just found out today by Dr. Roseboro, and I, I still hadn't seen We hadn't seen it right, but I think we're the best in the Northeast. <laughs> So I can relax that my hopes and dreams have been fulfilled. <laughs> okay, our next certificate of recognition is a, is awarded to Anna Corbin for contributing to the North Carolina Digital Learning Competence for Teachers and Work Group. So thank you so much, Ms. Congratulations. And thank you. 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 Ms. Angela Dennis for meeting Governor Cooper for STEM education. So we were represented well at the governor's mansion or wherever they met. Let's give her a round of Amazing, amazing. Okay, the next certificate of recognition. You're gonna hear this lady's name a lot tonight. Casey Council for completing the Northeast Region Aspiring Principals Leadership Development Program. Amazing. Um, 
We're a lot of fun. I just said that I said this fun is a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. So the next certificate is awarded to John Mo Beaumont for also completing the law for the student aspiring principal yeah. leadership development. <laughs> Our next award is awarded to Jennifer Brickhouse for completing the monthly. <laughs> And I would like to uh, reiterate that being a part of the Aspiring Principles Program and completing that is something that we in the district honor because it lets us know that you are prepared to for leadership and that you have some leadership opportunities available where you can help the district perform at a higher level. So we, we congratulate you. Thank you. Wow. So this certificate is awarded to Christina Harris for leading expected growth in sixth grade math. <laughs> Okay. So our next award, I have two for one person. Um, this certificate is awarded to Casey Council for meeting expected growth in seventh grade reading and meeting expected growth in eighth grade reading. Excellent. 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 Awesome. Awesome. So the next one is funny to me because I saw this lady earlier today and she didn't look like she snapped. So when I said, no, you have bought the CT East brother out, she said, it is who I am. And, and, and it's evident because Laura Big is awarded this certificate for meeting expected growth in career management. <laughs> And she's back again, Jennifer Brickhouse, for exceeding growth expectations for math three. <laughs> The next one I have, the person is not here because they they, they resigned only this year. But Kristen Dawn White met at Spectre Global and Foundations of Health Science. And she's not here this evening because she has our mm -hmm. students that are in the 
Nursing home. Amen. Set up the clinicals at the nursing home and the and they will be taking their tests to be like your CNAs, counseling, first minute. All right. Well, and the next one is so hard to build. I'm going to check this COVID. Um, it means a lot to the district when we have people that fall in place and that uh, can assume many hats and many roles. And I realize that it has not been easy for this person, but we certainly want to give a standing ovation to Ms. Carolyn O'Kelly mm -hmm. for being the interim principal at Columbia mm -hmm. Middle School. I was trying to put two days by everybody's going to work stuff, so I didn't know how she did it. I knew how she did it. Woo! Okay, so we congratulate all of you this evening, and um, we're very proud of the accomplishments that you've made. And we, are, we just know that this is the vibe that we just want to continue as we continue to make our better. So, congratulations to you all. Congratulations to everyone who got recognized tonight, and thank you for all you do to the Carroll County Schools. The great school system that we are. So we really appreciate all the. <laughs> Next are in service and instructional program um, reports. And first up, our school reports with data review. And we're going to start with Carol Elementary School with Ms. Bailey. Clickers right there if you need it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm always tasked after the celebration, <laughs> and I feel the energy goes. So we're going to keep it up. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot to celebrate. Yeah. 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 And this is have a presentation for TES tonight. Okay. All right. So we're going to keep this energy up. Okay. So what I have for you tonight is an amazing data presentation. Okay, for TES. Okay, and as you guys recall, these are our school improvement plan goals for the 22 23 school year. One important note that I would like to point out to you guys is the very first bullet you'll see that we stated all students will show at least one year's worth of growth based on grade level assessments in academics. At the beginning of the year, we had academics and social emotional. Um, and we went back and talked about that as a team and realized that we really didn't have anything that we could come to a conclusion um, or a platform to really assess that on this year. So after speaking with our coach, we decided to take that out. And this year, we are just focusing on the academic. So I didn't want to point that out to everyone this evening. Okay. All right. Now into the good stuff. Okay. So first up, we have our diddle data. So... Um, at the elementary school, our kindergarten through third grade students um, take the in-class assessment, or what we call doodles, okay? So this is a time test in skills for our kindergarten through third grade students. And when I say time, what I mean by that is these assessments, students have one minute, okay, to complete these tasks. So when you're looking through this data tonight, you might say, oh, this is data may not be as high as some of the other data that's why because a lot of our students need to work on fluency right and so you know yourself as well as i do somebody tells you you've got a minute to do something you may not do it well okay so we're building that fluency and that accuracy with that so you can see where we are above benchmark at benchmark below benchmark and well below benchmark across the school level with our graph here okay so a lot of growth since the beginning of the year, okay? So we're very proud of this data. 
Next up, here is our reading check. So this is our third, fourth, and fifth grade data. And this data is amazing. Okay, mm -hmm. so needless to say, I can say we're not going to have the parking read. Okay, so teachers are doing a great job. Students are doing a great job. Everybody is working hard, and it shows in the data. Okay. And I'm getting ahead of myself here. We'll talk about this a little later in the presentation. But teachers in the room know that EOG um, is, when you look at EOG test set, reading for information is what's highly tested. That's a strong suit for our kids. Okay. So we're seeing that trend. So that's a good thing. Okay. So we, so we want to keep that up. So we are super proud of this data right here. Do we have room to grow? Yes, we do. But we will get there. Okay. okay, so what are our strengths? Again, reading for information is a strength across third, fourth, and fifth grade. Okay, so our students are doing well in there. We're going to continue to build on that and bring the literature strand up as well. Um, uh, the number of our students at 50% or above grew a lot, okay, with our check in data as well as in M class. But again, in classes time with those skills assessment at one minute intervals, okay? And the language domain is also a strength in third through fifth grade. So again, reading right now is a strength for us in our upper grades. What are our three opportunities for improvement? Improvement, again, to support teachers with data analysis and creating the small groups for our intervention and enrichment time um, and sharing instructional strategies and our letters training. A lot of times we don't share what we do in the classroom that works. And so we have to get better at that. We can't just go in the classroom and close the door and say, oh, what I'm doing is working. So I'm going to keep it to myself. Okay. Well, if you taught that standard and your kids not did out of the park, I need to know how you taught it. So I can tweak it, make it my own and see if it works for me. If not, then guess what? I might have to teach your kids that standard because I taught, because you taught it that way. Okay. And then again, the creation of the short cycle assessments and common formative assessments. And this is a district level, um, I don't say thing, but this is what we've been working on at the district level as well. And the next steps to address the learning gaps, um, we do have a Title I tutor um, and a reading specialist um, that's full in small groups, but we've also added a 3 5 interventionist. Okay. So her focus is math, but she's also pushing in to um, provide ELA support. Um, we have after school tutoring taking place in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And then we will have an end of year data day with strategic planning for our EOY pacing, meaning we're going to look at what our streets are, what our weaknesses are, what's heavily weighted on the EOG, and we're going to map out the rest of our year and how we're going to fit that into the weeks we have ahead and really hit it hard moving forward. Okay, math data. Math, you can see here our math data is doesn't look as well as the reading data does, but our math data was a sore spot for us, okay? So we know that that's an area we have to continue growing, but there is a lot of growth here from the beginning of the year. So again, our teachers have worked really hard, our students have worked really hard, and we will continue to push forward, but we are seeing the growth. Again, um, with math, it's different. It's not like you're comparing apples to apples. Different standards are assessed on each check-in. So you may have more of this standard this time versus the standard that you had last time, okay? So you may be more heavily weighted in fractions this time and algebra this time. Um, and so we do have to take that into consideration when we're looking at this data to determine where our outliers are. One of the things that we noticed, which we found kind of odd, is our students do very well with the calculator inactive portion of the test. Not the calculator, active. Calculator inactive portion of the test. Okay. So when we were analyzing our data, that is one of the things that we noticed. So that's great because that tells us our kids know how to work out the problems. Okay. 
So they know how to do it. Okay. And again, we're seeing growth across all across all grade levels. An area for opportunity, showing them how to use a calculator and making sure that they have opportunities to use that calculator in the classroom. So what we were seeing is our kids didn't know necessarily how to use the calculator and weren't practicing using the calculator in the classroom. So when it came time to take these assessments, they didn't know how to use it correctly. So they were getting the problem incorrect. So that was a conversation that came out in our PLCs around our data analysis for me to be able to say a calculator needs to be in their hand every single day. They need to practice with a calculator every single day because that is where we're missing the mark. Okay. Um, providing teachers with time and coverage to observe other teachers' classroom during small group time. Our teachers do a great job with whole group, but we still struggle with small groups, especially with math. It's a lot easier for elementary school teachers to have small group with reading, not so much math. So we really need to, to work on that as well as hands-on with manipulatives. So that will continue to be a focus for us. Our steps to address the learning gaps, again, after school tutoring, the three five interventionist who that is her main area of focus is math okay um supporting teachers with internalizing lesson plans i know you guys have heard dr rosler talk about internalizing lesson plans um but that is a real thing you know when we're up there teaching kind of moving away from the lesson plan because we're we're used to teaching it this way right but our lesson plan says this and if we're supposed to be following already and that's not what's in the plan. Some teachers know how to do it. Some teachers may struggle with that. So we've really got to focus on internalizing lesson plans and focusing on what we're supposed to be doing in our lesson plans, especially with our small groups of students. The PLC data talks, again, the end of year data day and the strategic planning for the end of the year. We will do the same thing for math that we will do for ELA. And those data days will be the week when we return to spring break. Okay, science data. Again, this year, um, we've seen probably 50 50 for earth, physical, and life science. So it's really been tit for tat this year, depending on which check in um, they've taken. So you can see here, it's been pretty consistent across all areas life, earth, and physical. We continue to have students in multiple subgroups score above 50%. So it's not just, you know, your white males or your white females that are consistently scoring. We've got EC students that are scoring above 50%. So in science is where we're seeing multiple subgroups um, score above 50%. Um, and this time we had 12 students whose scores ranged from 40 to 49%. And most of those were at like 48%. So we had several students who were very close to being at that 50% or above. And for opportunities for improvement for science, again, that hands-on interactive learning. We've, we've just got to get that in the classroom. Um, again, the CFAs and the implementation of remediation intervention for science here in the science plot. I kept that in there because that's not something that we have been able to finesse and really do. And so that's my reminder to keep pushing that. Again, fifth grade is different because it's three tests and subs. So you only have 90 minute blocks for that. So that is a little more difficult. So that has remained in there because that is something we will push as we close out the end of the school year. And then again, we have after school tutoring the data day and the strategic planning. And that is how we planned our after school tutoring was around <laughs> our strengths, weaknesses, what was most heavily weighted on the EOG. And we have a different standard that we're focusing on for each week for the week of tutoring. Okay. Okay. And celebration. So again, we had our middle of the year data day. Teachers worked extremely hard. 
Um, teachers across all grade levels are getting into the routine of our assessment cycle and data talks. Again, that's not just three five, that's K2. We're getting them into the routine of giving CFAs and, and what that looks like and having a discussion of, okay, well, what students mastered, what students were near mastery, what students didn't, what can we do differently moving forward? How did you teach this versus how did you teach this? So we're getting into the routine of those. Um, teachers have done a wonderful job of discussing the student data and determining next steps. Okay, is this something we need to go back and do a whole group corrective teaching for? Or is this something we can do in small group? And they have been utilizing the iReady resources. Um, after school tutoring has, has been a big hit as well, as well as our 3 five intervention. And it's been a wonderful asset. All right, any questions? How many kids are participating in um, after school tutoring? We have eight in each session. Mm -hmm. And that's third grade ELA, third grade math, fourth grade math, fourth grade ELA, and fifth ELA math and science. And our students come every day. So we, we have not had any issues with attendance. We did have some parents that opted out, but if they opted out, we just opened it up to someone else and gave them that. Excuse me, gave them that slot so that we can make sure people felt good. And I just have a quick question. This is a silly question, so forget yeah. it. On like the y axis, that yes. that would be yeah. what yeah. is is like this the number of students, like total students, or like would this be like 11 students? How, what is, I can tell you more here. Okay. Yes. So I saw all these students. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I already put this here because for some reason I don't know why it does that. It doesn't. It didn't do one like this. Did ten and these two five. I don't know why. It that is the so yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Lovely. Great thing for having it to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys. Next up is elementary and middle school um, with um, Dr. Robert Tripp and Ms. Carolyn O'Kelly. And at this time, I'd like to say welcome, Dr. Tripp, to um, our high school. Glad to be here. Your first six days. <laughs> okay, so this is our data um, after the second check in. Hold on, let me try this again. All right, we'll try again. There we yep. go. Sorry. Our school improvement goals. Uh, June of 2024, all of the CMS students will be provided character education support and reinforced positive procedures to improve discipline and daily attendance by 15%. The goal for this year was 207 referrals. When I did this, we were sitting at 213. By 2025, CMS will increase math achievement and composite scores to 60% proficiency. Our target for this year is 45%. And in June 2025, CMS will increase reading achievement scores to 80% proficiency, and the target for this year is 65%. So for our ELA, we had two sixth grade students that got over 90%, which was actually pretty good uh, for them. Some of the issues that we had in terms of standards that were missed, um, <laughs> The seventh graders did really great in this one standard, trace and evaluate the argument and specific claims and text and assessing for sound evidence and support. That standard was at 70% for seventh grade. That was the highest um, standard out of all of the exams, was that one. And for our sixth grade, out of the eight standards that were tested, six of them were 50% or higher. Three opportunities for improvement, we kind of have the opposite problem of TES. Uh, reading for information is where our students really struggle, uh, except for that one seventh grade standard. All across the board, sixth, seventh, and eighth, it's reading for information. 
our steps to address the learning gaps, and we also have after school tutoring. We have our vertical PLCs, unpacking of the standards, daily work in iReady. We use iReady for math and for ELA. And then to really dig deeper into those standards that had a 50% or higher proficiency to see what's going right and what can we do for our other standards to get those higher. <clears throat> This is the number of students. So in sixth grade, we had, it was split. 17 of our students were above 50% and 17 were 50% or below. In seventh grade, we had 11 above 50% and 14 that were below 50. And for our eighth graders, we had 16 above 50% and 24 that were below. For math, Sixth graders are really rocking it out on this check-in. Um, we had, again, another two students, different students this time, uh, that scored a 95.8, so essentially a 96 on check-in number two for sixth grade math. We've moved to a live virtual math platform for seventh and eighth grade math for Elevate. First semester, they didn't have Elevate, and now they actually have a person on the screen to teach them, and that has increased their scores. Uh, we had a 50% proficiency rate in ratios and proportional relationships for seventh grade. That was the highest uh, standard that we had. Opportunities for improvement. We have sixth graders that need some help with multiplication and division, divide fractions by fractions. Seventh grade is solving those real world and mathematical problems. Eighth grade is analyzing angle relationships. And our students across the board really struggled with the technology enhanced questions. So that's where they have to drag the different um, blocks to answer the questions. Um, and they did not do well with that at all. Next steps, we have tutoring. Um, shout out to the high school for uh, helping our math students to have a real teacher to provide that tutoring for them. And then we're again unpacking the standards, our PLCs, and daily math homework in those iReady books. And also on Friday, they were doing weekly multiplication drills to increase those foundational skills, which as you can see, that multiplication and division uh, is something that they get hung up on. And for math, we had three students in sixth grade that were above 50%, 31 that were below. Seventh grade, we had four students above 50%. 21 that were below and eighth grade we had four students that were above and 38 students that were below for science we have some really the last one for science Again, we had one student that scored really high with a 96. The class average overall is 53.3%, which is the highest percentage out of any class average for any of our check-ins. Um, so that was that was great. We had more than half of the eighth grade get a 50% or more. Uh, 21 or 50% or above, and we had 20 that were below. Our opportunities for improvement, some more in-person labs so that was currently happening. We need to continue that, that hands-on science. And the two standards that they struggled with the most was explaining the structure of the hydrosphere and inferring the age of the earth. Again, some of our next steps, tutoring, unpacking of the standards, vertical PLCs, and really dive into why did we do so well in science? What was it about those standards? that gave them that success. Some celebrations. Um, the faculty and staff really worked hard at being a team this semester because I could not have done anything without anybody else's help. So when, you know, they use the words rally the troops, that's really what was happening over there. Um, and I'm so appreciative of that. Sixth graders, all sixth graders uh, were participating in our social emotional learning classes this semester, and we already talked about Ms. Jennings, um, but she was selected to participate in the SciMatch, and I know our students are going to be super excited for that. 
Um, our tech and data three, we have preliminary data for that. Um, and let me just tell you, the next presentation, that sixth grade math data has really come up. So we are on the way up. Mr. Um, Kelly, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to the whole middle school team. <laughs> y'all are the smallest of our teams, and I just want to tell y'all how much I appreciate y'all. And I know this is you see numbers, and it looks like it's yeah, everything, but I, I see how hard y'all work, and I just want to say thank you with a lot of holes y'all had, especially in math and science. I just want to say thank you to all of you, and also I want to say thank you to the high school teachers for stepping in and helping your colleagues at the middle school. I love that geniality. I love that y'all are coming together as a team and excited about the future again for that. But this is really exciting, which leads into a question. <laughs> looking at your data, looking at the middle school, and I know high school is yet to go. Are we starting to have synergy among our three schools and looking yes. at where some of our yes. discrepancies are? Okay. I look forward to hearing more about that and how we're gonna address some of these discrepancies and because it's starting to set it, you can start to see trends mm -hmm. from your third, fourth, fifth, moving into sixth, seventh, eighth, and I'm sure it's gonna show the same thing in some of our test stuff at the high school. But I just wanna say thank you all for continuing to strive for the best for our students. <laughs> and next up is Columbia High School Early College. Okay. This time I've been here longer than a week, so I, I know a little bit more about school than I did last time. Um, what an exciting time to be in a district with a new superintendent and two new principals and myself and a lot of new folks coming on board. Um, it's just an exciting time to be a part of it. Um, and we all are thinking outside the box, thinking about ways that we can help move our students forward. Um, high school is a lot different than elementary and middle school in that you have to create value for the students that you serve. And with every conversation I'm having with every student and with every set of parents, I'm learning that more and more as I get to know the community learning their values, learning how to appeal our educational values in the community, um, learning to teach them about the value of education, even in a rural community. So some of our data supports that. There's a lot that does not show up in PowerPoint. And hopefully over the course of the next year, we'll start revealing the pieces that go into that. I have conducted all of my one-to-ones with all my staff members, and I've started one-to-ones with seniors. Okay, these school improvement goals were from 21, 22. I added these to the PowerPoint because these are all qualitative. And you can see meet expected growth, expand on our partnerships, be supportive and safe for every student and educator in a place where needs are met and relationships are strong, build a team culture, deliver internal communications, and ensure the communication is provided to 100% of the stakeholders. These are our current goals, and this is all quantitative. So our goals are to increase EOC proficiency in biology um, to 55%, English 2 to 60%, Math 1 to 55%, and Math 3 to 55% by 2026. So I married those two because this is really part of the vision and mission we focus on, and this is the quantitative result that we're going to get as a result. Okay, so in English 2, two of our 13 students um, score greater than 60% to 15%, and five out of the 13 students were greater than 50% in the first common formative assessment. We had a high score of 71. So that's seven out of 10 questions, 13 out of 20 questions were correct. Um, for the first NC check in, three out of 13 students are greater than 60%. That's 23 of our students, 23% of our students. Seven out of 13 were greater than 50%. Yeah. And our highest score is 79.2%. Right. This is one of our elder teachers in the building who reinvents herself every day. And she is working with several of the coaches from the Paris team. I get emails regularly about her reinventing herself every day. And we have 
such a commitment in her for serving the students she teaches. A3 strengths, we showed improvement in the percentage of questions correct from the first CFA to the first NC check-in. Our English 2 teacher is making great progress with a CARES team coach. And now our English 3 teacher um, will have a teacher of record face-to-face in English 1 and that's fourth period block. So instead of the elevate teacher and the teacher assistant, we now have a teacher of record in place that's face-to-face in the middle. Opportunities for improvement are support teachers with data analysis and the PLC protocol, continue sharing instructional strategies, and continue the process of unpacking the standards. Our math teachers are very comfortable in hacking the standards. They're excited about it. They're bringing our biology teachers and English teachers along the way. My next step is to involve our support teachers so that they can feel the burn of the testing pressure and see how that process unfolds itself so that they can go and look at their standards in areas that are not tested. Okay, our math one data, two out of 39, I want you to keep in mind that the students that are high flying students take math one in eighth grade. So their scores going to be accounted for in middle school. So they're not going to be in that data set. Um, the highest score, however, was 87.5. So even in the math one group, of the students that are taking it in ninth grade, so the next tier, below the high of the high, we still have scored 87.5%. Um, in math one, above 50% is 8 out of 39. That's 21% of our students. And I can tell you that that's higher than some areas of the state. Um, but the lower down of the county, that percentage is 8%. So we are making strong gains for an economically disadvantaged area, and that's due to our quality instruction. Math 3, 12 out of 25, 48%, and Math 3, uh, above 50% is 59.5. So 60% of our students taking Math 3 are at our grade level Math 3. Okay, so we are making, if you notice on the slide that the middle school show you from eighth grade, where all the students are below 50%, we're making a lot of gains and a lot of its recovery from COVID from the time they're in eighth grade to the time that they're in juniors in math three. So you're going from a really high number of kids not passing and not being proficient to making up those gains in math one, math two, and in math three, we're seeing 60% of those students are at or above 50%. Okay. Am I going to have? We're good. Okay. Um, check in one, math one. Now, what this tells me is that our CFA is not as rigorous as the NC check in. If I had to, to step back and look at this, so we may want to look at our CFA and kind of rework that test so it's more rig rigorous. So, zero out of 39 students um, were above 60 percent, three out of 39 students are above 50 percent. This is going to be closer to the ESG. So we want to continue to push the rigor and push the endurance for our students. I have a question. I'll question. Sure. So CFA for everyone is the common formative assessment. We make that in-house. Yes. Okay. And we are testing on a three-week cycle for continuous improvement. Okay. Thank you. Um, and it's really good because students get to different questioning and different levels of questioning, but our teachers are constantly revising teaching methods and informing their instruction based on data. Okay. Um, that? I just wanted to add something. The math one, the check in has a calculator active and a calculator active part, but the CFA right now is all calculator active as well. And the math three is calculator active on the check in and the, uh, and the CFA. So um, just keep that in mind as well that the check in does have a non calculator active section and a calculator active section on the check ins, okay. but not on the other. So we want to make them more alike. Or none. Um, okay, I we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so math three, nine out of 30, 23 students are above 60%. The highest score is the ninth. Okay, and that is exceptional data for this teacher. Math three, 15 out of 23 students is above the 50% for 65%. And again, you see our math three scores. So we're making up a lot of ground from middle school to high school. And in the post-COVID era, I can tell you that's really great. 
Okay, and I'm not going to read all the C because you have these, um, but math one students last semester, there was an improvement. Um, math three, there was an improvement. I've talked to different math teachers, and they said they hadn't seen the test before. So the first semester, they didn't really know how to, you know, triangulate their, their teaching with the students. The second semester, they were better prepared because I had seen the style of questioning on the answer check. So they were better prepared to teach the students with what the question types would look like for them. Okay. Two veteran teachers are teaching math. They have a thorough understanding of the standards. And we know that human capital is our best investment for kids. Math one students are having trouble interpreting functions. That's the first standard that needs to be unpacked. 67% of math three students are having trouble creating equations and inequalities. Vertical alignment can help students conceptualize the mathematics. Today in our instructional services meeting, Dr. Tripp and I have talked about ways to align our schedule with time and periods so that his eighth grade math one students can be served by our math one teachers at the high school. So that will help eliminate there being an issue of not having an eighth grade math one teacher in the future. I have a question about mm -hmm. that. That was that wasn't being disrespectful. I just didn't know if everybody knew what that meant. So that's why I was explaining all that statement. But how are we developing those? Um, and you say we need to match it. So is it the same time frame? Because how I'm envisioning CFAs or common form of assessments, still like a quick check-in, like the NC check-ins. Is my vision correct? What is that? What does that look I think like? they're now developed at the, the central office le level with Audrey. I think in the future, we can have the help and support of our math teachers reviewing those common form of assessments to make sure they're rigorous, make sure the standards are on, go through the rubric and check in to make sure all the questions that are in that case <laughs> are represented there and scoring them. Um, I think that's going to be easier for veteran teachers that know the standards, maybe not as easy for beginning teachers. Is that how it's been? Mm -hmm. And we've been, uh, I have been communicating with the math teachers. They have shared with me what standards have been covered, as well as using the pacing guides, looking at pacing guides of where they were and what standards should have been covered at that time, plus looking at the check-ins to see what's covered on the check-in versus what is not, plus looking at the uh, the um, EOCs and the percentages of, uh, of the standards that are being covered in there. So lots of ways. I'm assuming once we get into this routine, we could potentially do some of those things on the formula mm -hmm. sentence next year to make life easier. And make them safer, make more students don't have access to them. Right. Oh, we do, and we use, I'm sorry, we do use SchoolNet as well for the high school level, and we do use a bank of, of questions, item bank that's only uh, available at the district level, so it's not um, anything that the teachers can pull at their level. It's a, a separate NCDPI item bank for those. Voices into that. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. It's also really difficult unless you deal with the standards too so to create a test somewhat is going because when you read a standard it has three different or four different types of functions but when we're at our pacing guide at a certain point, we might only cover one or two, but the other five are still present. So you really have to be aware of which function or which question. So we actually were able to look back at the questions and when we did the data, we did um, pull out those questions that we had to cover the, that function, but we had covered the standard. Um, uh, even though we had mentioned what type of function it was, it wasn't called on the test. So we did try to make sure the data was accurate based on the standards that were actually covered at that time. So you said in the future, we could just even talk more, create the create the CFAs together just to make sure they're even more aligned. Especially with other teachers. Yeah. And then align with other districts who have given us the Thank you. Okay, biology, <laughs> 10 out of 34 students, this is for the NC check-in, were above 60%. The highest score was at 87.5%. This is an exceptional score for our biology students. Most of our biology students are sophomores. I'd like to move that in course sequence to be in a junior class. I think our scores will go up, and I think students maturity-wise will be more prepared to make it as juniors. 
So they'll have earth science, physical science, and then biology. And 14 out of 34 students were above or equal to 50. This is NC check-in two. And if you notice here, the scores were a little closer, even though we have more above the 50% range, 10 out of 34 were greater or equal to 60%. The highest score was 85%. 20 out of 33 were greater than 50%, and we had 61% of students that were 50% or above. Okay, and these are some things with biology. We sent all of our science teachers to a secondary support for science and Granite Rapids. They loved it. They were able to unpack some standards, ask questions, dive deep into curriculum immersion. Um, they had a great experience with that. Um, NC check-in two results were better than NC check-in one. However, it's very hard to compare the two because they're not cumulative or comprehensive. They're tested in different areas. So we have to actually look at the standards to see which students learn better than others. Um, biology teachers had the two full day PD opportunities. Three opportunities for improvement or more hands-on, opportunities to regroup and reteach. The second one is the one I'm most interested in really encouraging based on standards mastery. Regrouping those students based on standards in biology whether it's ecology or genetics or evolution and reteach photosynthesis and regrouping them based on standards. And continued support for content area professional development. CTE, Ms. Biggs, can you go ahead and show me real quick? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. So woodworking one, um, the first thing you'll see, this is just credentials and certifications, kind of the same in one. And there's only certain ones offered in certain courses, but it's building upon um, each level, that's why you see a one and two in some of these courses. So Mr. O'Kelly is doing fabulous in woodworking with 100% proficient in OSHA construction certification. They do a great job with that. <laughs> and then um, in that um, woodworking, the saw blade certification, that's only in level two classes that can take that. I think there was one that mixed up. Your small engine NC certified technician is Ms. Atkinson's. Um, Agnet class, and then Adobe Illustrator is Mr. David Spruill. This is um, something that we're, is new this year, the Adobe Academy. We're seeing growth in it, um, but there's still a lot to be tested this year and this semester, but, but we're doing pretty good so far. Um, and then, I say, I it got a little wonky. Okay, so then Adobe, but you can see Adobe Photoshop, boom, boom, right there, 14 out of 23. That is really good. Uh, Mr. David is doing a great job with that. Um, and then we'll be getting our DNA certifications coming up in May. That's the last one we usually get in. Um, I'm not teaching career management this year, so that's not up there, but I have early childhood education and I have six students in that, and they should be earning their North Carolina literature equivalency certification at the end of this course this semester. So we are looking really good, um, and everybody's offering most of the credentials and certifications that we can offer currently in the course. Okay, and these are some celebrations. This is not a complete list. These were just mm -hmm. the ones that came up to me um, one night late. I'll work on this presentation. Hands on in the classroom, we want to give our kids authentic experiences, whether it be in core classes, CTE classes, out in the field. We want to give them authentic experiences and real world experiences to use what they learn. Um, field trips is field trips to businesses, field trips to community colleges and universities. We want to get kids on the campus, um, even if they don't think they're interested, because we, a lot of our students and their families, don't know what the opportunities are, and they don't know if they're interested until we expose them to that, and that's what we're learning. Um, club days on Fridays geared towards student interests, partnerships with community organizations live theater productions, the CSU trio and talent search, safety presentations, parent night information events, student scholarship awards and college acceptance notifications, SEL mental health support, CTE internships and work study, and increased rigor in the classroom. Now, I usually don't end in a bad mood, negative mood, but this is going to keep me awake at night. We got our ACT scores today again. And all these things are showing progress and great news. But I would be remiss to not share with you the bad news. Our ACT composite is part of our school accountability. 
Um, last year, 2021, 2022, they changed the scoring from 17 to a 19 for college entrance into one of the 17 UNC schools. This year and next year is test optional, so they are not requiring an ACT score to get into college university. We are not doing really well in the ACT. I just got the score sent to me, and only two of our 37 students scored above 19. And the ACT, 19 or better, is what the college board uses to say that student is college ready for a four year college or university. Of the third, and that's only 5%. And now here's our own student perspective, and I'm going to sit down because I'm going to lose sleep over this tonight. <clears throat> um, 42% of all the 11th graders in North Carolina are earning the composite score of 19. That was part of the reason they increased it. Okay, so 42% of all the students in North Carolina are earning a 19 or better. For us, it's 5%. Okay, this is the minimum ACT score required for consideration for admission to one of the UNC of University of North Carolina's 17 university systems. By 2030, the goal is for 70% of students to be getting that 19. Now, this is the part that I find most interesting. And this is going to be my goal for next school year. So I'm holding accountable to it. By economic disadvantage, which is what our county and our high school qualifies into, 21% of economically disadvantaged students score a 19 or higher in 2022. So we are off the mark from 5% to 20 to 21%. So my goal for my students and my teachers and my school is going to be up to that 21%. And I can tell you that was talked a few years ago, eliminating the current accountability model and using ACT composite to measure school accountability. It's because it has reading, English, mathematics, and science. And that may be our fault. We haven't trained the students. We may not prepare them. We may not have talked about ACT and all. Uh, I'm not sure because I'm going to have to make some changes to that program and while I'm here. But I couldn't share all this with you and not share that data. Um, and I'm going to have our counselor talk to those students. Now, the good news is that they take it for free their junior year, um, but they can also take it their senior year. And we had one, two, three, four students in addition to those two that were two points within the 19. So that would take us a lot closer to hitting that 21%. So um, I have taken up enough time. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. So just to, just to talk about what we voted on the last time with performance matters. Within our performance matters data warehouse that we purchased, we will have the ACT package built into the performance matters. And so a lot of our formative assessments the things will be aligned to the questioning of the AC2. So we have that partnership within the performance tabs platform. Also, a part of the MTSS, um, the multiple tiers of support uh, process for the high school, the high school will be required to build in a study hall or a, a structured study hall where we're doing ACT prep. In speaking with the students, the students have stated that they were under the impression that once the ACT or the SAT is given at the school level, that there were no more opportunities to, to retake. And I have since met with several individual students who says to me, they have come over here to ask for help privately to say, I, I, I need to retake that. So I'm just of the mindset there's no reason that in Terra County schools we cannot sit with individual students to be sure they have their career development plan clearly stated out for them as well as having a course sequence guide for them to follow if they choose to go to a two-year or four-year university 
and for us to ensure that they have the waivers that they need to retake the ACT and provide them with the multiple locations, especially if they drive, they should be able to drive to the ACT. So those are things that we are doing to, to troubleshoot um, the issue of the low ACT score. I would say that most um, high schools traditionally talk about the SAT more so than the ACT, and I have since talked to them about some personal stories of a lot of educators and a lot of successful people who were successful with the ACT and not per se the, the SAT because it's more well like um, Ms. Williams is also planning a transition day. Do you want to tell them about the transition day and what we're going to do with transcript audits um, and preparing them for those plans? We're going to call them in by grade level. And once they are registered for their courses, I'm working with the registration committee. Um, it's the Starlight Committee for CTD, um, Ms. Westcott, Ms. Smith, myself, and our core math and ELA teachers. Once the ninth through 12th graders are registered, we're going to bring all the students in. We're going to put a current transcript and we're going to bring additional people in. It's going to kind of be like a career fair, but for colleges. So in the morning, we're going to review transcripts and the audit of that, which Ms. Smith has already set up. Which Ms. Smith, she's already set up the audits for that. Group Jones has added the college courses audit. So it's going to be like a checklist at a glance of all the courses they have taken in addition to their um, individual plan for the future. And then we're going to give them the afternoon opportunities to meet representatives from colleges and universities and discuss their options. Because a lot of students, even if they have what we consider a lower GPA, they still meet the minimum requirements to get into some colleges and universities. And they just have never been told they're looking at college. So in finding out what those requirements are, having talked with those students, set up visits, um, but the big thing is making sure course sequencing is correct. And then next year, personal finance and the new civics will also go into effect. We'll be offering in sequence the history classes. Ms. Williams, I think Mr. Scripture has a question. Sure. Mr. Scripture, go ahead. Yes, ma'am, I've got a question. Last month at the meeting, you came to us to ask about, uh, to request a calendar change to hopefully curb some absentee problems we're having with the school. Do you, rem do you remember that? That was so that after the exams, students would not be coming for the afternoon session. Yes, ma'am. And we also there was concern that the students that were after school that you all would be able to keep track of them. Is that correct? The, the calendar feedback came to you guys before I became principal. No, no. There was a question at the meeting: Is would the school be able to keep track of the students who did who weren't able to go home early? Yes, sir. Okay. Within that week, I got a call stating a student who was taking a test that was promoted and scheduled by the school was absent. And when I called, I was argued that that school, that child was indeed absent. So my question is, how many of these absences are errors on our part? And how do we intend to make sure that we know where and what our students are doing while they're at school? I can answer that, but it's going to take me a lot longer than this meeting to answer that for you. But I'll be happy to answer that for the board at some time. It's a really long answer. Okay. I, I mean, I'll be happy to spell out bullets and send it to you guys and to Dr. Roseboro, the challenges we're facing. Um, but it will take me about 20 minutes to share with you those reasons. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I did get that. Okay, but I have a question. Okay, and, and this is also for the little target on Could you help me understand those eight graders that are taking Math One? How would they fit into all of this? So do they take the eighth grade? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just a nice clear of the eighth grade. And see Math One. Okay. And they just did their first check in. Um, check in two when the um, 
ninth graders take their math going championships. It would be all on that same schedule. So where does that base class A go with the high school or just over the it would be combined as math for sports. But for, for that for school, for school sports, it says you Okay, thank you. Pat, um, yes, uh, Dr. Kirk, would you like to show what the norm is for that in terms of semester long? Oh, yeah, it's not the norm there. But they're long Part of the idea is to have not going to be a big school. Right. So, for that school, then you start back for August, where the high school has foundations for math, but they go into math for it. The foundation only focuses on the inner part of math for The middle school will get the holistic portion, so they'll get the entire curriculum broken down and scaffold up piece by piece by piece in each individual segment. The, Ninth grade foundations portion of math where only focuses on two or three objectives, but they rebuild those foundations and then they teach the math one portion and the entirety within the second semester content. So, what you're looking at is a much more, uh, as they like to say, depth and breadth of the school math that is far larger and more supportive for the student than the high school version of math one. The intensity, speed, and then support of the teacher in the eighth grade. Much better. That will be for next year, but we didn't count it once we were all on board at groups that our our big graders are taking the semester long. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. But they should have had it. They were put for the first semester, they were put in their grade level math courses. So they were building their math skills in preparation for going into math. Okay, thank you so much, Jessica. I have a follow-up question on, on that. How does that work? I know that we have elevate right now, right? Um, there's some of our math courses. One of them is not on the How do you have an elevate teacher teaching that? How do we put in that time for those I ready and the uh, other um, courses? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the elevate teacher is not the same as the high school teacher. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that we're going to have to have the elevate teacher teaching the elevate teacher for the amount of class time. So we're going to be put in that extra time to do the elevate. Okay, in the classrooms. Our elevate uh, students only do their I-rated um, book work as far as their homework aligns with the state. They don't double up to me. Um, but what we have seen is that our elevate students are improving in their mathematical concepts and, and, and thinking just in terms of conceptual understanding. Um, we have very strong elevate math teachers. Those of us that have been in those classes, we all agree that they're very strong. It's the logistics of the classroom and making sure that our students stay engaged in the process that we're kind of concerned about there. But in terms of the level of instruction they're getting, it's, it's equal to what we would see for an in person teacher. Like so Miss right, so Miss Mitchell is sending that home as part of the practice, their practice for her. She checks to see she has the answer key, and so she's been checking that. Oh, okay. yeah. and I was just going to say, as a parent, not, not as personal this time, but as a parent, the elevate is working way better than the experience we have with BPS that was so great, like went from a 45 to an 84. So, like, just with Elevate, and this is a child that was like two or three points from four to five on her sixth grade math energy. <laughs> so, just the logistics of having that structure from Elevate has built something that's so just from the parent perspective, just put that out there. Um, I, I mean, one student and our eighth grade math students and take their ready books home for reinforcement of those math skills because the parent is only in the book that shows the parent exactly what they're supposed to do. So that is aligned to the standard that the elder teacher is teaching just for reinforcement and not necessarily for a grade. It is to do that. Miss Mitchell is checking for the accountability.
Yeah, that particular is the practice problem. Are there any other questions for um, the data reviews or the reports? Um, hearing none, we'll move on to our exceptional children's programs update. Okay? And it's nice to welcome back Ms. Amelia Devore. <laughs> I'm sitting back there thinking it's been about three years since I stood behind I know. the podium. <laughs> and it's still just the same. <laughs> 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 well, thank you all, uh, reading board chair board members, Superintendent Roseboro, and all of you here. I stand before you to give you a brief update to the uh, regarding the exception children's program. But first, I would be remiss if I did not thank you all for the opportunity to come back and share with you all um, the little bit that I do know. And I thank you all for the opportunity of having Ms. Fox to be here and, and work with me and guide me along the way, um, in a good way, <laughs> as well as the EC teachers. Um, we've had some bumps in the road and we're still having bumps, but as with EC always, we just roll with it. And so I just want to share with you all a few updates um, for our program. Um, the Exception Children's Program, the first, the first slide speaks to the instructional and the academic um, area for special education in our schools. Um, this slide is going to give you information about how we are addressing our student needs in reading and in math and which programs they're using right now. You all are aware that the district is undergoing um, of trying to establish a core. And so right now, what we in the special ed department, we're trying to identify what supplemental resources we're using with the children to support the core. We will always be following Jenny as lead so whatever programs that they're using, our EC teachers are involved with those same programs. The principals are doing an outstanding job of including them and making sure that they're getting to the POCs with the gen ed teachers so that we can talk about strategies and how we're going to get the best bang for our buck with our children. Uh, we are, I, as you see, I have listed the current programs that we're using um, in elementary through high school for reading and math but I want you to pay attention to the pending section. That's the section where we are planning for how we're gonna be more strategic and more deliberate in the instruction coming from our teachers um, to our students, the direct programs such as reading, mastery, corrective reading. And for high school, we're gonna, gonna <coughs> expand upon ingenuity and add in my path for high school. Because right now with high school, we don't have a a supplemental program where they are collecting the data for the progress for the students. Elementary and middle, we have I ready, so we can collect that data. But high school, there's a gap there, and we're working on to, um, securing a program that's going to work for the teachers. Now, I meet with the teachers monthly, and we talk about how we are serving our children in better ways in which we can serve them, and the teachers are aware that um, our principals are going to be more diligent and holding them accountable for our students' um, achievement, as well as myself. But also, in addition to uh, the reading and math, we're also working with social emotional. They're working with the uh, social workers in the district, as well as the principals in Gen Ed, as we're working with the Go Zen program. And I did not put that up there, but we are also working with um, the IEP teams in, the, in developing and establish quality behavior intervention plans for the children who might be having those behavioral struggles in the classroom. And those of you who know me know I'm a talker and I talk fast. If you need me to stop this, you know, wink at me or something and then I'll, I'll slow down. But the next slide we want to talk about speech services. Currently, we have 30 students being um, served in our speech program. Here in the district, and just for um, just for comparison's sake, we have about our head count 
lists uh, about 77 children in the program. I believe it's around 77, and you see 30 of them are receiving speech. So our speech program is still huge. Yes, we are providing teletherapy through Max Healthcare because we didn't have, did not have a speech therapist at all, which allowed and which caused for us to um, offer compensatory services to our parents um, for the speech. But we do have um, a speech therapist who is working um, Monday through Thursday and on Friday she's doing paperwork and providing the therapy. Now, what I do want you to notice is that I do have speech therapy assistant up there. We don't have a speech therapy assistant per se, but what we have is teacher assistants at the elementary schools who are rotating support for the speech therapy because, you know, teletherapy is virtual. And, you know, our children are virtual for a little while. So we have to have the adult in the room. And our um, Ms. Bridges has done an outstanding job, she and Ms. Fox, in setting up a rotational schedule. And I do know and I do recognize and I'm not ignorant to know that Ms. Bridges could use her TAs elsewhere. And she so fit to realize that speech therapy was very important. And so right now we are, um, are, are yeah, it's working. It's working. <laughs> but they're telling me I need a real person to come in and deliver speech yes. there. And so I hear them loud and clear. Yes. And I'm in talks with four different speech companies that say, please just give me one speech therapy to come into our district and work with our children. That's our goal, to get us a live person to work with our children again. Um, and so you all will be here more about that real soon because Dr. Roseberry, every time she looked at me and smiled, and she said, Miss Jethro, <laughs> where are we on speech? And I'm like, oh my God. And they call somebody else. So we will begin the speech therapy very, very soon. Um, we are also working on getting an in house school psychologist because that is also very much needed. And so those same companies that I'm calling around, I'm asking them, do they know a psychologist or a company that would give us um, psychological services? We do have a contract, but our therapists, our psychologists only come in for evaluation. We need a person who's going to be here to work with the MTSS program as well as to do the evaluations that we need. Because although we don't have a whole, whole, whole lot of children, we have a big, 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 big need. So um, that's what I'm working on, trying to make sure that we have the people in place that can meet the needs of our children. By way of um, nonviolent crisis intervention, this is not on the slide, but we do know that we have several behavioral monitors who are working with children in our district. And so we are working to secure training for those monitors who are working with children, behavioral support training. And I've also talked with a, a company who is gonna come in and provide the training for our principals, our teachers, our staff, to, to so that they can create behavior support teams at their schools. But in addition, he's going to provide train to trainer models so we won't get caught again. We'll have our own trainers within our district so that they can train our people every year. Now, compensatory education. This also is a hot button for our, for our EC department because we do have gaps in staff. And when students are not, are, do, when students do not have their um, EC services, especially education services, then the parents are offered compensatory education, meaning we're not trying to make up because once you lose time, you lose time. However, we can go and try to offer some services to help them kind of close gaps a little bit over time. But I wanted to share with you briefly just our process. We have overhauled our process from last semester. I've met with the principals. We've also met with our instructional team and Dr. Roseboro, and our process is as follows. And I wanted to share with you because when parents call you, you can you will have some lens of what's supposed to what is supposed to happen. So initially, the parents will be informed of that there was a gap in service. A gap in service occurs when the child special education service is not um, able to be delivered, either because of teacher absence, school closure, or whatever reason but the parents are going to be informed. Then the parent is gonna be asked to come and meet with the principal. The principal and the parent, with the support of the teachers, you know, because the principal is gonna pull the teachers in, um, the parent will be given an option to either receive or decline. 
Right now, we have sent letters out for um, middle school parents um, in the absence of teacher, as well as for speech services. But the principals know that starting last week, I think when I met with them, I think starting Thursday, I told them every time the EC teacher is out, parents should receive notification that the EC teacher is not there and there they should be off compensatory service. Now, this mute, the parent and principal must mutually agree upon the amount of type, the amount, the type, the location, and the service to be provided. The children will only receive services on the goals in which they did, where they, they were denied access to. So it's not like they're gonna get them today and then they're gonna work on the whole year. No, whatever goal is in the IEP, that's what the compensatory education should be delivered according to that goal, okay? Well, like I said, we can't make up time. However, we can continue to uh, teach those goals, remediate those goals so that those children, those gaps can close a little bit more. And once they come up with their plan, the parent as well as the principal will sign a compensatory education plan. So that's something that you all need to just tuck away in one of those brain cells to pull out. Ask the parent, did you do the compensatory ed plan? And if they said, I haven't gotten anything, call the principal, okay? Because that's where it starts. They can call the central office, they can talk to Ms. Falk, Dr. Roseboro, they can even talk to me. But the, the law says the principal and the parent will mutually agree. So principals, and I'm gonna say this joke because they know my personality, they've been put on notice, they already know. <laughs> if they call up here, we're coming back. So that's our compensatory ed plan. Um, process and unless I click them wrong, that's all I have. Do y'all have, have any questions for me? I just have a question, and this might happen later on down the road. You mentioned like once we adopt the four, which I think is probably maybe talking about, but we'll talk about supplemental, and I'll share that also again uh, when we talk later. But just think about evidence based supplemental resources and also resources that um, with companies that we select that have third party research mm -hmm. to prove um, that their um, supplemental resources work. I don't know where we're at as far as the evaluation process, but would love for that to be included in that process for evaluating. I understand and you're, you're exactly right. And it definitely will be because with compensatory air or with just special ed in general, we must always use evidence-based um, programs. Sometimes one of the things that when we met, when I met with the EC teachers, one of the things when we started talking about curriculum and I asked, what curriculum are you using? And me being an EC teacher myself, I knew. They were like, well, I just pull stuff. And that pulling stuff is not what is allowed, not supposed to be done, it's supposed to be evidence-based. So that's why the first thing we did, we tapped into iReady because iReady has a, a supplemental <laughs> section just for special education or kids who will be behind. So that's why the elementary and middle school was, was kind of okay, because I, all teachers know that we're supposed to use our reading. High school, we didn't have anything. So we're pulling things, uh, the teachers are pulling resources, but I needed to be evidence-based and have scientific research behind it. And I know with the, pro, I sit in the um, instructional team meetings every Monday, woo I'm sitting every morning and I talk with the, everybody, there's everybody, who all like to come see sometimes. We are all talking about instruction and we're talking about curriculum. And the way that they, the systematic way that they went through to establish the core for the elementary, middle, and high is second to none. So I have no doubt in my mind that they have, as they said, ring out all of the bad programs to choose the, the best programs for core. And that's exactly what I want to do for EC. And I'm doing it with them. So it's not just me and Fox and the EC teachers alone. We're doing it with the team for the district. Thank you. All right. In the words of my pastor, you said all you know, it's time to come. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is the criteria update.
<clears throat> All right, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> All right, good evening. Whoops. I'll start with our curriculum update, which we were just talking about. Um, and so, uh, all right. Okay. So, um, we are working on adopting an ELA as well as math curriculum for K through 12 to implement this upcoming school year. And so one of the first steps in this process was I sent out a Google form survey to TCS teachers and instructional staff um, asking what it was we were looking for, what was most important to them, what was most important to include for students as well as for teacher resources. And some of our um, parameters that were important include of course, being aligned to the science of reading for literacy, at especially elementary level where letters is taking place, aligned with the mathematical practice standards for math, aligned with standards in general, support for multilingual lingual learners. Um, our teachers also stressed that they would like to have some kind of intervention program within this curriculum, something that was easy to use. Training, they would like training once we do have our new curriculum in place. And in the world we are now, we would like for it to be technology enabled. <laughs> and then um, one extra said others or other, including the decodable readers or uh, decodable text at the elementary level. So the survey result, I think because I'm in present, present mode, it won't let me. Actually, I'm just going to keep going from there. <laughs> um, okay, I do want to be able to put these things up. Um, okay, so for the process for what we're going to do for ELA, at the elementary level, we're going to do a, a two-phase process, or this has already started. Um, at the elementary level, they have um, roughly about seven different vendors uh, that they have started with. And these vendors, um, the first step is they plan to use the CDE instructional programming rubric. We have been given um, many different resources from the Office of Early Learning as well as our CARES team. Um, and so this was one of the rubrics that they chose to use to evaluate, first off, to take those seven and narrow it down by evaluating how much is it aligned with the science of reading. Once they've narrowed it down to two to three choices, and then, then we're going to move on and use another rubric, which will be a little more teacher friendly. And this will be like a general rubric where, uh, there, now I'll let me open it. Um, I'm sorry, let me go show you the other one first. Whoops. Oops, sorry. Oh, man. So this will take you to the very detailed rubric the elementary school has chosen to use um, to narrow their choices down based on if it's aligned to the science of reading. And this is from the Colorado Department of Education, um, but it's being used nationwide. And so within here, it's actually will download a, but I just wanted you to see how detailed this rubric is that they'll be using. And so across the bottom, you can see it's very, lots of tabs where um, they're in phase one evaluation right now, and then they'll move on to phase two. But uh, just to give you an idea of what all it looks like, you know, we're looking at the sections of, or the foundations of reading, phonological and phonemic awareness, as well as phonics and word study, as well as vocabulary, and on and on. So I just wanted you to see the detail there versus once we've gotten through that piece, then we will 
utilize this rubric, which takes in some of those parameters that we saw in the surveys that teachers submitted, the things that they wanted. And so um, we have aligned to the science or to the North Carolina standard course of study, high interest, engaging content, materials presented in an easy to follow format, integrated assessments. Um, is there digital curriculum? Um, teacher materials in addition to student version, uh, differentiated materials, intervention materials, that was one of those parameters, and so forth and so forth. And so this is what we plan on using during PLCs where teachers will actually take those two, those two vendor and score. And based on that score, then our next step would be to have all of those scores and get back here, I'm sorry. Um, and so then for both ELA and, and for math, after we've done that, we're gonna score and select based on those scores, the final curriculum, and then we present it to the board for approval. All right, and so um, right now, these were those vendors that I was referring to. Elementary ELA, I said it was about seven that they wanted to, um, to evaluate first. So again, we're taking that science of reading and doing that evaluation first and then narrowing it down. And then for elementary math, we're looking at SAVAS and Vision and H and H go, go math. And then for middle school and high school, ELA, we are looking at the college board, springboard, as well as H and H into literature. And then for middle school and high school math, SAVAS or SAVAS <laughs> and Vision, H and H into math, and then Springboard also has math at the high school level. Okay. And that was it for that one. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. Next up, I'd like to give you a little update on our after school tutoring. Okay. And so uh, I think you know a little bit about this, but we do have current currently have after school tutoring from third all the way through eighth grade for English language arts and then high school English too. And then third through eighth grade math, as well as eighth grade and high school math one. Then we have high school math three and then fifth and eighth grade science and high school biology. So all of these course uh, subjects are being offered at after school tutoring one day a week. And so here it is, that one day a week for nine weeks total, approximately. We've had to have had a little incidents here and there where things have had to change or cancellation. But for the most part, we have our Tuesdays groups, our Wednesday group, and then our Thursday group covering everything, what subjects and which days. We tried to also uh, do this so that we have students that would be able to attend if they if they needed tutoring for more than one subject. We tried to make it work so that they could attend on more than one day because of that. And so approximate number of students per course, you can see for, uh, this is what Ms. Bridgers has shared, um, eight. So third grade, fourth grade at eight, fifth grade at six, sixth grade at seven, seventh grade at nine, excuse me, nine. And you can see therefore, this is for English, all of our Englishes that are being offered. And then for math, our approximate numbers for math, this is what we have right now for math and all of the courses, subjects that are being offered after school. And then for our science. And so this is what um, the structure looks like for our tutoring sessions, um, roughly. There's a do now section up to 15 minutes. Then we uh, provide a mini lesson, a direct teaching up to 20 minutes, and then small groups up to 40 minutes. What they're using is the iReady Teacher Toolbox lessons for small group differentiation. Um, and then at the end, some kind of quick formative assessment or an exit ticket. And so that's what our structure is looking like for after school tutoring. And 
The materials that we're using include our released EOG and EOC items at the CMS and CHS level. And then we have iReady for TES and CMS. Um, within that is Think Up, which is a good intervention program. Uh, IXL we have for CMS and CHS. IXL has uh, all four. It has ELA, Math, Science, and Social Studies at the middle school level, as well as uh, ELA and Math at the high school level. And then we also purchased um, from the ABC or American Book Company, we purchased the EOG slash EOC test prep um, books for our tutoring groups, as well as they have a whole online piece as well. And so we have those for every, all of our subjects and grade levels that are being tutored after. And then um, another resource that CHS has is Delta Math. And that was the last one for that. Any, any questions about the after school tutoring? I think that's on our list, one of our list. Mm -hmm. And then there's Ed Reports as well. Mm -hmm. We've got a big list of good resources. Next is school plans and school fairs. And the first stop is uh, transportation. Good evening. Um, I reckon this is the same way to welcome It should be. I don't know, y'all. I'm getting over there. Put my eyeballs on <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> okay, we're going to start this thing. First of all, I'd like to say, um, um, well, let me be a part of this. I ain't been here but about eight months, but I have really thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I've learned a lot. This was a step up for me from where I came, but I have learned a lot, and I really appreciate the opportunity. It's, uh, it's been very eye opening, I would, I would say. So, but anyway, I've learned some things. I have seen some things, some things I don't really care, I don't like, some things I like. So, but anyway, um, <laughs> we're going to start off by the um, replacement of the county car. Um, and this is just something that's kind of coming up in the near future. I just want to let y'all be aware of it. Um, as y'all can see, it's old um, and it's got a bunch of miles on it. It's high miles. I actually written, written miles down, it's got uh, right down 100,000 miles on it. Um, if the engine has an issue when it gets hot, the engine has a knock in the bottom end of it. When, you, when it's cold and you crank it up, it gets fine. But when you let it run and get warm, you start hearing a knock in the bottom end of it. Um, air conditioning don't work exactly right. It blows out the defrost all the time, so it falls your windows up. Um, <laughs> I mean, just being honest. So it means just something that we're going to need in the future. In probably the near future, unfortunately. I hate to say that. Um, and I told uh, Dr. Roseboro, I wouldn't send my wife home nowhere. So I, I can't expect nobody from here to take off with it, especially go on a trip, a long trip. I, I'd be very precautious of it. If it's around town or somebody can come and get you if you break down, <laughs> that's one thing. But I, I definitely wouldn't take it for a, a long trip, just being honest. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's something. What's the year? I don't know exactly what your model is. What is it? What it is, is a Mercury Grand Marquis. It's old. It's, it's, it is old. Um, and I just kind of give y'all some some insight. I've done some search, some research on it. Um, 
to get a new car or SUV or whatever. And we're looking at months and months and months and months out right now still. So I mean, getting ready to do it. It's still going to take a quite a period of time to get it. Um, Just have a question about this. And, and I know Terrell's not a big county for this, but what happens to cars that the count that the sheriff may confiscate because of people who did not do something they were supposed to do? What happens to those vehicles? Like in bigger counties, they hit an option for the school system. Did we have that? I know it's hard to get out. <laughs> I'm talking about people who drive under the influence and those cars are confiscated. Like, have we ever reached out to find out? Yeah, yeah. But if there's a seized vehicle, yeah, and it's sold, then the proceeds of that sale, these vehicles, do we ever do we ever find out what made that car is because it may be beneficial to yes, that when there is a seized vehicle, then I'll put it in Okay. Is it? I mean, I don't hear this. And Lord, our Lord. Could we follow up with our lawyer and see how they get that report? Because if someone like we sees the vehicle and it was a good car, according to our mechanic, I would think that we would probably bolt the car instead of taking the first seats for it being settled. I'm scared. It's the boss. It's Yes, but that's, that's what I was trying to say. We researched that first because mm -hmm. uh, he was even out there searching to see if we could get a car from a local dealership or something. Yeah, he was looking at a local dealership. We also went online and looked at the surplus for the state. All them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Lisa, I'm going to ask you well, I don't think we can quite do that, but I, I when I did call and, and inquired about it, um, um, when I did call and inquire about it, they did tell me that your chances of getting a, a SUV would be a lot greater than it would be for a call. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving on, just kind of this, this, just start out. Let y'all know what, what was going on with this. Um, next of all, this is a need. Um, we need, we need some activity buses. As you can tell, um, we, we have one mini activity bus. Um, uh, it's old, it burns a lot of, a lot of oil. It burns just about as much oil as it does gas. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it ain't that bad. But it, it, it does it, it does burn quite a bit of oil. Um, it, and it's more economical if you got a smaller group. Plus, the other good thing about it is you don't have to have a CDL license. So any, anybody who's got a direct driver's license can jump in and go with it. Um, a big bus would be great. We've got two right now. Uh, we had an incident uh, in Oakley Coast this past Friday was a week ago where when they got busted out, they put the bus out of commission and couldn't use um, when it was on back order. We didn't know what was going to So luckily I called a glass company in Winston and they said, bring it to me, I'll cut you a piece of safety glass and put it in. So I took the door off and took it to Winston and had a glass put in. So, but we were down, we were down. Miss Sherry called me today. We won't know if we have another bus for Thursday. We need to know for Thursday. We don't have another. We're, we're really short. So, I mean, that's something that something that is a, it's a need. It's, it is a, it's a, real, a big need. Moving on. There goes our current activity buses. Like I told you, the minibus, it's got a bunch of miles on it and it does burn oil. Um, Full size buses, put on there, we're putting a bunch of miles on the current fleet. Um, and we are, but our numbers, we just don't have a, a, enough buses to supply the demand, especially when the activity field trips get going. I mean, you really, you really need another bus. Um, this is something that me and Dr. Roseboro has talked about. Um, this is a, a uh, service body for our work truck. Um, actually, what we have right now is just a, 
So it's the F-250 pickup truck. It's got a toolbox across the bed of it. It's got no air compressor, no tools, no nothing. If we have a bus breaks down, or one that has a flat tire side of the road, <coughs> we're kind of doing it. We're in, we're in water. Oh, yeah. um, I would su su definitely suggest um, possibly a, a service body on the back of the truck um, and get some tools on so we can actually use it for what it's meant, meant for. So we, if we do have a breakdown or a flat tire or whatever, we can go to it and, and take care of it. So, and then at the bottom of it, just a few things that we need uh, if we were to get the service body, um, just like a jag air compressor, a few little hand tools, something at least we can somewhat hopefully put the bus back together to get it off the side of the road. But I won't do, definitely do won't leave one set beside the road. So that's a that's something that we need to look into too. Um, y'all, when I when I got here, I got a uh, a list of things that uh, of the buses that were had, had been going through or had been inspected by another county. I think they talked about every one of them, um, and I've had my I've had my chance to go through them. As y'all heard earlier today, um, they've been going through pretty pretty good. Um, but just to let y'all know, the bill that we received, the work that was done, all except the, the one bus that I know of, I, I don't know of anything about. It's broke down. It's sitting in the back of the lot, and the state said that we're not going to fix it. The motor's messed up in it. So I don't know anything about that bus. I have not done anything with it other than pull parts off of it and keep the others going. <laughs> so just kind of give y'all an update on, on, on that, that, that issue. Um, here we go again, inspection score. Um, y'all heard it wrong ago, 17 and a half from a 57 and a half. Um, only thing I ask, next year if we go back to 57 and a half, don't be ready to shoot me. <laughs> it's good to get praised, but when you when you get, go the other way, it's, it's hard on. Um, but I'm hoping it. I'm hoping it don't go nowhere near. I can't tell y'all where I came from. Uh, the last year I was there, we scored 18, and that was the best I'd seen. So I came in here the first year, and it's a 17 and a half. So we we we're still in the ballpark. So and then. I just recommend to see if y'all would approve the purchase of the, the new buses um, to help us out with the, for the students as far as this travel. We have a question. Okay. Um, well, I think last year, last year, we were told that um, we're going to get two replacement buses and two new buses. Actually, this coming not this year, but this coming school year, we actually got five that are age out. We'll get five new ones next school year. And that's and the yellow plate. Yes, yes, that. And also, we got a. I was told it was going to happen in March. I still haven't seen it. I still haven't got an email on it. Um, there is a. Um, it's kind of far out, but it's a Volkswagen um, lawsuit that's going on where they're buying back some of the international buses. It's got a certain engines in it, and we have one. Actually, the one that's broken down with the engines bad was would have been a second one. Um, if we could have got it in before the motor messed up, we could have got both of those buses replaced. I understand they're going to do another round, so there may be a chance we're going to get six of the buses next year. But I know five of them, five of them will, will age up next year. That was the one you're talking about, but broken down. Probably the two places yes, that we would expect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
into assembly, please? I, I can't get in assembly. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. The mini golf was quoted at 80327 to be paid for with ESSER funds. I don't know which one I'm sorry. This one's mini bus. Can you see that link? No. <laughs> oh, you can't see it. No, it's too small. To, all right. Let me let me get down here. So she blew it up. Yeah. 85,770. For and that's for the is that for the mini bus? Yes. yes. All right. And how about the full size bus? All right. That one, this one right here, right? One thirty-seven, but I don't know if it's got packed. He's got all the packed. One, one thirty-two. Yes, sir. Sorry. I guess my question was: These new buses have a lift. I didn't no. see the mini bus no. did. This is not. Is there a reason why we don't want to go with a lift? Or I mean, we we can go with a lift. Um, the only issue you have with a lift with a mini bus. You already limited on how many you right. can carry. The bus. We've right. already got it. We've got a big bus. It's got a lift on. Right. I'm just saying, it goes down. Not having another big bus. The lift. Is there a reason why we don't want to have a lift for this new big bus? Think about the future. Think about ahead. No, I mean, there's really another reason. I mean, we could get one with a lift on. It wouldn't be no issue. It wouldn't be no problem. Is all of this coming off out of ESSER funds? Yes. Yes. My, my next question is we're going to purchase a mini bus so that, you know, our non-CDL drivers can drive it. Do we do motor vehicle records checks and driving checks on all of these people that we're going to allow to drive this? Yes, sir. And are they, and are they randomly drug tested like our CDL drivers? I don't know about the drug test. No, because we. I think the drug test is just for the CDL drivers. Are you drug tested? I can't understand what you're saying. So you don't have to have a passenger endorsement for. Not for the video. Right. Lee, I asked them to get a recommendation for us looking at adding that into the, uh, a policy. So it would be like a straight up a regulation. Because that's a very good point. And we do and we do and we do do driver driver record checks on all of all drivers. Yes. License bus drivers, I'm not sure about that, right? That's how we need to do some information. That's part of the safety protocols and things that you said that need to be enforced. However, it is in your policy description. It's vague in your in your policy. We'll have to add an administrative regulation. It's it's vague in the policy. Yes. About yeah, and that's that. That's yeah. That was my question because it doesn't really say what we do. Right. I mean, it do it. Necessary to That's a very good point, though, to bring up to ask you because I didn't see it there is a request for a motion to use ESSER funds for the purchase of a mini club activity box. So Ms. Robin has made a motion to approve the mini bus purchase and full size activity bus purchase of ESSER funds. Is there any discussion? The only thing I would like to add is you know, for us to look into the possibilities of adding a other to at least one of the buses which we're going to talk about equity. I don't want to discount students who might not be able to go on a field trip or do anything else because it's a disability. So I would like us to look into that. Um, the big bus? At least the big bus. I understand it would take a lot of room for the mini bus, but I do think that 
if we're looking into this and we have the to funds to send it, I think that is important for us to make sure we're providing this for all of our students. It's noted by Booker to adding a letter for that. Is there any other discussion? <laughs> will, will, will that change the price of the bus? Yeah. I think it would. I can I can, I can get an uh, estimate tomorrow. I'll be glad to put it. And I'll leave to the thing. Yes. Okay. Is there The motion on the table is to approve the purchase of any full size that's being lost through the funds. How do you vote, Ms. Jody? I have all three seconds. That's okay. Um, you said the motion on the board was to purchase the board that we have some minute to the board of our student tax and fund, but we might get an additional flow more than how we have it. We didn't say so. Do you want to wait till we get the board? Is everybody okay with that? Someone say it. My question is to the word. I want to put it into the and then the motion that it does in the record that also would have to be. Or not. We wasn't talking about it. If not, it won't be. Would you like to withdraw your motion? Have a new motion? Or would you like to amend your motion? I will amend my motion to approve the purchase of our media and full. Is it for a motion to purchase a mini bus and a full size activity bus with Lyft to do those funds? Is there any other discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, how do you vote, Ms. Jody? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Jamie? Yes. How do you vote, Mr. Lee? Yes. How do you vote this, Robin? Yeah. And I vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is our CTE learning lab update with Mr. Barath and Mr. Um, The one to the right side. Good evening, board members. Dr. Rose Pearl, yes. Uh, here to give you an update on the CTE Learning Lab construction. And more importantly, as you'll see by the slides, what exactly is going on out there? Um, it's been something that I know you've been keeping the back of your mind. Hey, we saw a fence go up. Hey, we saw this, but why haven't you seen anything else out there? Well, give a little history quickly. Uh, the notice to proceed with the contractor, A.R. Chesson, was December 9th, okay? That was a while ago. I know it was. Um, the contract is to be done end of August. It was substantial. And then the final completion and all the punch list everything is done the end of October. Okay, sound like a good, solid schedule. 
able to get in there like right after the start of the storm and again using the building. Um, so far to date, doesn't look like much, only four bullet items there. Uh, they directionally bored under the ground, new data pathways under the parking lots to the buildings. Uh, you don't see that. Uh, technology got to see that and appreciate that. Um, demolition of the storm drain, again, in the ground, you didn't really see anything there. You saw the fence go up and the silk fence around the property and the job trailer out there, and that's it. That's been that way for a little while out there. Now, here's why. North Carolina general statutes and the North Carolina building code require material testing and special inspections of school projects, uh, public dollars they're trying to protect. There's been instances in the long, long past where contractors cut corners, things didn't stand up, they kind of came down and stuff. And so the state, in order to protect the investment of taxpayer money, adopted some of these requirements. So uh, what we did was we went out and did a qualification-based selection with uh, Dr. Roseboro and staff and identified a material testing team at Terracon. <clears throat> They're out of Elizabeth City and brought them on board to do their work. One of the first things they asked from the design team is where is the geotechnical report? Because in order for them to validate the compaction strength of the soils that the foundation of the building is going to sit on, they needed to know what the result of the study was of the soils and what lies below. Uh, contacted the architect, asked where this report was. They didn't have any record of one. Uh, checked here with Mr. Patrick, Dr. Roseboro, and others. There wasn't one. I remember this project goes back three years or so from when it first started. It went through a lot of iterations, went through, I think, three bid processes until the funding matched the able to construct it. So a lot had happened, and apparently throughout somewhere in that process, no one asked for a geotechnical exploration to be done to test the soils and the suitability of them to hold the building. Well, we very quickly uh, worked with legal counsel for the board and uh, staff, and Terracon was able to add to their contract to come out with the drill equipment, take the sampling, send them off to a lab for testing. So that was conducted in February. The final results come later this week, but we have some preliminary uh, results from the team. Uh, they're not what we'd like to see. Uh, you can see here some of the settlement issues. Total settlement, about two inches. Elastic settlement, about an inch. Long-term consolidation, about an inch. A lot of movement, a lot of potential for the building to move. And it's the composition and what's below the sand out there that's driving. So it's the elastic soils that are the problem. So their recommendation is to use something you already have in the contract. You are raising the elevation of the floor of that building about five feet up anyways. That amount of fill being brought in there and allowed to sit for 60 days will surcharge those soils and compact them, okay? So that's good news. You don't have to bring in plates and do all this additional heavy equipment work out there and stuff like that. Problem is, it needs to sit for 60 days. Can't do anything. Put the dirt out there, let time and pressure do its thing and compact it all. After that, you may build it. Uh, settlement will be less than an inch after that, which is acceptable, and everything can move forward. So I took uh, AR Tessum's initial construction schedule duration for activities out there. Originally, they had a little lull in their schedule because the metal building fabrication takes a long time nowadays to get it delivered out to the site. So there was a little opportunity for little manipulation of schedule to catch up for time, a little slip. Uh, there isn't that anymore, especially with this additional 60 days. So using roughly their duration of activities, you're looking at 37 weeks from now, which puts it out about November, okay? Not where you wanted it right after opening school. Now you're looking at mid-year uh, use of the building in there. Next topic, obviously time, what's going on, all that. Want to know? Also want to know where we are with the money. So... Uh, the contract about $1.7 million for the construction of the facility to date, 88000 has been uh, billed and uh, we're uh, paid. We're withholding 5% of that. Uh, general statutes allow you to have a little leverage over contractors and withhold some payment to keep the carrot dangling in front of them. 
So I haven't spent a lot of money on this right now because not a lot's done. They can't invoice for anything that's not done out there. So they've got permits, they've got their mobilization, got those initial borings of technology and sewer dem or storm line demolition stuff in there, and that's about it. However, during this whole process of starting, we began identifying items and elements that don't compromise the instructional spaces nor the ability for Mr. Patrick and his team to maintain the building. Things that we can change to save some money in the project because some unforeseen or something that didn't get caught in the design always comes up. With. So that's what a list of these are. Some of that, they're all negatives in the parentheses there. If there's nothing around them, like uh, the bottom one, putting down luxury vinyl tile instead of VCT, that just means you never have to wax this building. So that saves a lot because keep in mind, this is a 1,700 square foot building away from the buildings that custodians are going to be going back and forth anyways with. So that'll save a lot over time. Here's some other items in there. Um, totaling right now a credit to you as a deduct of just uh, under $14,000 per day. There are two large items that they're working on getting pricing on right now. Um, the uh, one of the rooms had a lot of power all around the room, all over the place, and data ports all over the place. Working with technology on what that room is going to do, how you're going to use it. You don't use data ports anymore. No one's plugged in it. They're all on Wi-Fi. And so they came up with a layout that eliminated about half of those. So they're getting the pricing plan. So there'll be a credit, more money coming back to you. In the mechanical room, in a traditional new school, big school, 100,000 square foot school, Given an electrical room that has the main service coming in, it's three phase. You have this huge distribution panel. You have transformers, a lot of heat generation in there, and other things that you have to ventilate. This is the size of a home, 1,700 square feet. By default, the engineers put in venting systems and all this like they would in a traditional large school. So they're getting the prices to remove that because it's no more power service than you have in your home. So the heat distribution isn't a factor in that. So there'll be more credits coming, and we continue to work with the design team, the contractor, see if there's any others worth considering. So that number will go up. It's also going to have another impact. This delay in the process of putting all that fill out there, how this would have been built had the soils been perfect, you can go right now out of the gate. They would have brought in one foot of fill, compacted and rolled it, set their footings on top of that. Then they would have brought more fill in to go behind the foundation to get it up to five feet. Now, since they have to surcharge it, they have to bring that same amount of fill in, but they've got to do it all at once, which means they have to then come back and cut in their footings when they do it. Also, we bring that fill in, you just can't make a perfect cube. It has to have a two to one slope away from it for erosion. So you're bringing in additional fill around the perimeter that you wouldn't have needed. So there's gonna be a slight impact. The contractor's working on that and hoping to have a number uh, tomorrow at the progress meeting board that we can update the board with at a later time and let you understand some of that coming there. But the goal again is to try to get to the point that we're able to identify enough value engineering opportunities that'll offset anything that comes up. So the next plan is hopefully to get all this resolved this week and begin moving forward so that it can have it 60 days and start bringing the fill in this week. And then uh, middle building actually is set to be delivered within the two weeks. So we'll work with the contractor and the school base and staff to identify an area to lay it all down to keep it uh, protected and safe until it's ready to go in. Sorry. That's me. My time's up. Um, <laughs> they'll provide an updated schedule uh, to my rudimentary 37 weeks and then start the footings hopefully within nine weeks, which is then you'll really see a lot of activity all of a sudden come bursting as they're doing footings and plumbing and everything under slab. And you start seeing it coming vertical. That's when everyone gets excited. So. Hopefully that'll happen within the next uh, few weeks here. It's a, on that slide, okay. 
it won't advance. So I guess that's my last slide. So I'm sure you might have some questions to follow up on this. I'm here to answer any that you may have. Are there any questions for Mr. Barak? Mr. Roth, I'm sure it's good to be the person. I tried to find the um, group before I joined the board, and I tried to go back and look at the text and the actual structure um, that was created in our minutes. It's super, super blurry. I don't know if the tweet chatted. Um, we have like a design that can be shared with the board. Okay. Absolutely. Um, what I'll do is we, we have the complete construction set. What I'll do is I'll break out the elevations and floor plans, get them to Dr. Roseboro, who you mentioned. That's a full set of all the details. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. You can study the mechanical life for the plumbing and have a blast. Yeah. Everybody's asking questions. I'm like, oh, me. What it looks like. Absolutely. I'm sorry, what? Dog, it would be dog, Officer Patrick. She had questions about the athletic field lighting. So oh, I yes. Updates on athletic field lighting. Um, Tara Khan did the um, soil test uh, last week. Uh, so we're just waiting on the lab results for that right now. Um, they're working together with Mosley, the engineer, to uh, clean their uh, soil test. Uh, and Mosley's design, they're just working together. And once we get all that, we'll be able to proceed on with the installation. Wait, so wait, no, that's the soil analysis will probably take four, six weeks. Yeah, I think it was, um, Sarah, I think, said about within that window, we should have the final results. In the meantime, they can start discussing between the engineer and the soils engineer the options. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions about the um, CT learning lab and Mr. Yep. Thank you for your with that. And then Mr. <clears throat> Patrick will be asking as well. We have an addition um, to the agenda with the, uh, we have before you an estimate with the um, HVAC system for the elementary school, I believe. Is that what we're calling this one? Um, yeah, so what that's about, we were um, looking at ways to use ESSER funds to improve the facilities uh, here at our school. And uh, one of the areas we focused on was HVAC, how to improve air quality in the building. Um, so uh, one area we uh, looked at in particular was, um, uh, and really in the interest of time, um, was just that we place uh, just do direct replacement which would require some engineering um and some of those units are the majority of them are at the elementary school or some of the older units um, a lot of that's at the high school campus have been updated over the years but um the majority of them at the elementary school have not so that's what most of this is for and it's separated in two different styles of units one of them is a uh, bar unit which is just a brand Rich style unit. Um, 17 of those are at the elementary school, two at the CTE building, and that's one quote. And then the other quote is for uh, like a split uh, heat pump system. Um, all of those are at the elementary school, and there's 10 of those. So we reached out to four different mechanical contractors. Uh, two of them came by looked at what we wanted to do and uh, give me quotes. And I had the uh, lowest quote was from the same contract, we two separate quotes. Um, for the barred units, it was uh, 247.8 to replace 19 uh, barred units, 17 at elementary school, two at the high school campus. And the, the split uh, systems I'm talking about that was 92,000. That's to replace uh, 10 systems at the elementary school. Um, 
both of those folks were from Armstrong and Son, which is local in the town. We do have Alex, of course, quoting stuff, we only have the 90s to have the do you have any? No, we don't have the 90s to have. Do you want me to email it to you? Can you spread it off like that? Yeah. Um, Does anyone have any questions about the one we do have? Are you able to see that in your text messages? All right. Don't go on the video. Let me come on mute. He's muted. Lee, were you able to see that quote in your text messages? Yes, I was. I was able to see that. Thank you. Yes. Does anyone have any questions on the before I just speak the proof of stuff? I think that we um oppose this estimate for I believe this is the same system. Mr. Uh, Jody has made a motion to move forward with the um, estimate 1.1 with its 10 units. Is there any discussion? There are no discussion. How do you vote, Ms. Jamie? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Jamie? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Romaine? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Robin? And I vote yes. We'll move forward with this. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dyke. You want me to wait? Oh, you think I've got enough, but I don't <laughs> Two ways that these do units will. For the information will help with air quality. They'll have uh, three heat dehumidification elements, and they'll also have like an ionization uh, air filtration system. In. We, um... Thank you. Um, next up is the financial report, Mr. Seven. What's that? Oh, okay, which one? Um, this one? Okay. My report's going to be very, very short because I don't have much for the waste. Oh, the summary of what we have uh, as of March the 22nd, we spent about 58 percent of our budget for this year. We had a various budget revisions, most of them were additional uh, federal funds that dropped in. They were not new funds, just funds that were brought um, to finish our review. We had one revision, and that was in um, regards to 109 for the dual and low income student funding that was part of 2021. 
and then we received our summer reading money for in October. <laughs> uh, so you have the budget reports that you had. Uh, if you had any questions, um, there were quite a few expensive uh, projects that were approved tonight. If you look on your uh, budget report in the Darcy 181, we had $1.1 million in funding left. That's we paid about half that those funds. And the rest of the money is scheduled for salaries and work for positions next year. So it's Darcy 171. It is on this budget summary page under the federal. That's the three ones. K K twelve emergency. Okay. Right. If you have any questions, you would email me. I'll provide you with some that information. I know. I don't feel bad. Next item on the board is policies, what? and just as a note for everyone. Oh wait, wait. I'm sorry. We have one more addition. I am so sorry. <laughs> we have uh, our two-way radio presentation. I apologize that we brought in this. So uh, last board meeting, uh, Mr. Brickhouse addressed you about upgrading our aging two-way radio equipment using the DPI school safety grant. Um, at that time, he had said we were going to wait. Uh, we were waiting on the vendors to update their quotes, get them finalized. Um, one vendor wanted to come back on campus and do some more testing. All that has taken place and we got the finalized quotes. We met with Dr. Roseboro last week and went over the quotes. And uh, the decision was made to go with uh, a quote submitted by Woodley Sales and Service. Um, you can see on the slide, we based that on several things, uh, mainly the price, uh, the services offered. Uh, the SROs uh, had a preference of the equipment manufacturer. They both preferred the, the type of equipment that Woodley uh, offered and also the familiarity with uh, Woodley's who's worked with us for many, many years. So what we're asking tonight is to approve uh, the quote that Woodley Sales and Service submitted, it, uh, submitted to us so that we can move forward with that project. Just to remind everyone, this was brought up last month when you presented us with all the companies and you gave us an estimate of what to get. Them. So that's why we have to get a bit of a So it looks like it. Yeah, this is the one that we chose. How much would like grant? The total safety grant? I don't know. Uh, the total safety grant. Um, Sorry, what was the safety grant? I know that what was outlined originally in the safety grant for the radios that I saw this price is well below that. That's not um, for the for the uh, radios of regional range, it is supposed to be seventy three thousand two hundred and thirty two dollars and thirty three cents. I thought it was one hundred and forty three thousand. This is for the Motorola. It, that may have been. It might have been after the revision. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was originally one hundred forty-three thousand. Yeah. 
I'm looking at the group revised requirement that was Mr. Chair, you've made a motion to accept and the group to approve the purchase of the two way radios with um, with these cells with service. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, how do you vote, Ms. Jamie? How do you vote, Ms. Jamie? How do you vote, Mr. Lee? Yes. How do you vote, Ms. Robert? And I vote yes. Thank you. Next up is the policies. Under our policies, we have two policies to look at. Policy A is policy 1710 slash 4020730, termination of harassment prohibited by federal law. And then B is policy 1720407235. Title IX, non discrimination on the basis of sex. To remind everyone, these policies, the only thing that's being updated on those is the contact information. And I'm now going to turn it over to Ms. India, who is going to explain the new system for updating um, these with the contact information. Good afternoon, everybody. Come on now. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to be very brief with this. Um, our staff changes um, so often and so quickly. So I asked Ms. Lindsay on the day that she was here to give us some advice as to how we can update this policy uh, when the staff change without petitioning the board. And if you look into assembly, if you look at yeah, that link right there, this is the same policy and this is the Title IX policy where we have all the stretch out. And what we're, what we're proposing to do is to insert a link where Ms. Audrey or myself can just go in to the web page and update the staff information instead of petitioning you each time a staff member come and go to uh, approve this policy. So what we're doing, we are just taking the Title IX coordinator that is off there. That space will be empty and the contact information will be at that link. You click on the link in the policy manual and it's gonna bring you to another page to let you know who the contact person is. And it's the same way for our uh, policy 1710. And for those who may need to know, our Title IX um, coordinator is Ms. Fanny Williams. And for policy 1710, we have the Section 504 coordinator. And oh, so we <laughs> yeah, this is a pretty lengthy policy. And like Ms. Powell said, we are not changing any wording of the policy. We are just addressing the staff changes. And Ms. Lindsay suggested that she needed a permanent person on our payroll to be Section 504, the ADA coordinator, the age discrimination coordinator, and the coordinator for other non discrimination laws, which will be the cell five. And again, we're going to have the link there. All of that will be clear in this policy so that when you pull the policy up, you click on the link and you're going to come to a page with that information with the updated personnel person that will be in charge of those assignments. Are there any questions? And I will be the one responsible of getting this to Miss Lindsay and let her review it after she gets approved, and then we'll send it to the extension and she'll have been in the hospital. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Any discussion? How do you vote, Mr. Yes. How do you vote, Mr. Jamie? Yes. How do you vote, Mr. Lee? Yes. How do you vote, Mr. Robin? And I vote yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is our superintendent's report. <laughs> I know it's a ball. <laughs> Which one would you like first? The superintendent. Okay. All right. We're going to move our calendar update to a work session after the break. Um, but we do we must approve because uh, we have things that are due that require our staff calendar to be completed. So we may be doing pending dates uh, for those things, for those items. But um, we want to provide you all with an update with our new Teacher Leader Acceleration Academy. And right now, we have a lot of our teachers that are teacher leaders in the district that are serving as the impact uh, teacher leaders where they are delivering in-person uh, to tutorial services to our students which they will be tied to their growth, their academic growth, as well as their proficiency. So we're offering them a $1,500 final bonus. Um, they will get $30 an hour for tutoring and $500 um, for growth and proficiency bonus in October. So when our scores come out, the students that were tied to those teachers for tutoring, they will be rewarded again. We also developed three additional teacher leader roles. Um, at the, we have the homebound virtual instruction lead teacher role because we have some students who have opted for virtual um, instruction. And that's not a remote learning activity. That's our virtual instruction option for our, fa our families that need that option at this moment. So it's not meant to be long term. We have a pre K coordinator position, lead teacher position at the elementary school and an AIG coordinator position as well um, for the district that are being paid for out of uh, Title I funds and our AIG funds. We hosted our first um, Hispanic Family Night, which was successful, and they will meet annually during the first and second semester uh, so that we're capturing their voices as a collective body. But then also we had a diverse parent meeting on March 20th. One of our parents was in the audience that's on parent advisory. Um, I hope that Ms. Lincoln will provide them with an update at the next parent advisory meeting about the board meetings, um, which we will be quarterly with those people. Um, but a really good diverse group of parents. And also we've had um, every school represented at this meeting. We received another project lead the way um, grant for our STEM education uh, program that we're launching. This will take care of our middle school. And so Ms. Jennings and David School are going to be our project lead the way teachers. And so we're starting with them first. We will offer no more than two courses for um, project lead the way. And then we have the next three years mapped out so that we're good stewards of the grant. So they will go to training this summer. And we're happy now that we have that 612 continuum in place. So the grant total was $9,100. Now we do have our calendar update, but I don't want to prolong that. So we can dive deeper into that. Um, but we have a Q&A available from questions that we received from the community where you can click on that particular question and answer um document to see us answer the questions we are going back to two separate calendars which is the way it was this school year uh to appease some of the comments that we received but um also i think the big difference is that our early college will get out um on may 31st whereas the rest of the district will be going to june 7th um, because they're the only school in our district that has the waiver to start earlier in the year. So we can dive deeper into that next week. Any other questions for Dr. Rosenberg? Thank you all for all this time. <laughs> 
Sorry, my say found her here. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. 